uh, comes from living in our wonderful city and uh, breathing in the wonderful air that we all breathe in. Uh, first of all, I would really love to thank Anisha for actually uh, explaining what monopolistic competition was. Uh, I admit that uh, we had some help from uh, Sundar who actually kindly sent it out last night. I did look at Wikipedia and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, when I asked him the question, he said, haven't you studied economics? And I did tell him that I did. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's strange that nowadays, uh, the concept of competitive advantage is probably uh, a slightly outmoded concept. Because competitive advantage, as a lot of us who went to business school in the early 90s or even earlier, uh, what we thought of competitive advantage then and what comparative advantage ends up meaning today is, is vastly different. The second thing that's vastly different is the time of the comparative advantage. And that actually has a great segue to the topic of, you know, in the age of, and it's not only monopolistic competition, in the age of, I would say, dramatic and disruptive technology, how do you manage a product life cycle? And uh, I have been very fortunate to handle uh, and be closely associated with brands that have uh, successfully managed this. So uh, I used to be brand manager for brand Coca-Cola in India. Uh, I handled brand uh, Whirlpool globally. All of these are over 100 year old brands. And now, of course, I'm associated with a brand like the Times of India, which will complete its 175 years uh, this year. So, uh, you know, I. I have been fortunate to be able to closely observe and be part of uh, journeys of some of these absolutely brilliant brands. And therefore, uh, I will draw very heavily upon my experience uh, to talk about how one uh, handles a product life cycle. Uh, first of all, uh, I would be a little disruptive on stage and say that probably the concept of product life cycle itself is dead. Because when you conceive of a product or a service today, in today's uh, day and age, you almost conceive it with a certain um, sell-by date in mind, right? So if you look at uh, how, let's say, smartphones are developed or how the product pipelines of uh, automobiles or durables or even fast-moving consumer goods is developed, I think more and more people are beginning to try and manage the brand life cycle as opposed to the product life cycle. Because the products that constitute the brand will come and go, but the brand values that you uh, institute and, and, you, and you manage over hundreds of years, hopefully will continue to get you the consumers and will continue to get you the, the sort of loyalty that, uh, that you are desiring. Uh, Product life cycles in general, for, again, for those of us who grew up on a nice staple diet of Phil Kotler and all the other uh, marketing gurus, you know, that inverse S-shaped curve where you would, you know, start slow, there would be a rapid growth upwards, then it would sort of start slowing down and then get into a decline. Uh, those were areas where you could actually predict or you could actually manage uh, it over a long period of time. So let's take an example like Colgate Dental Cream, right? Colgate Dental Cream, uh, by definition, is probably a 65, 70-year-old brand. I'm not sure how, how old. Uh, and yet, it continues to be the leader in primarily the same form and fashion that it was there in uh, probably the 1940s or 1950s. Uh, it is a very, very successful product, and it's a very successful brand and, and, and uh, continues to be the leader. Uh, I would argue, however, that the reason that Colgate Dental Cream is so successful and continues to be the leader is because the company has managed to figure out that there is a core set of consumers and then there is a peripheral set of consumers. And how do I keep them within my brand franchise? So suddenly you will start seeing Colgate Total, suddenly you start seeing Colgate Sensitive, suddenly you will start seeing Colgate Whitening, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is almost like, a, like creating a flotilla, right? You have this main mothership, which is what will keep you going, 
churn out cash, get you the shares, get you the penetration. But here is another set of smaller ships that's actually protecting the mothership. And along with the smaller ships and the motherships is what gets you the juggernaut that you want to create uh, for the brand. So that is something that, you know, uh, when you look at the product life cycle, you have to look at how do I manage this, not only with product X, but for brand X with product X, Y, Z, A, B, C, you know, how do you create that whole brand value going into the consumer? The second thing which is becoming more and more uh, relevant for us as we uh, get into, I would say, a new age of marketing. In fact, this says Marketing Myopia 2.0. Uh, it's really a question of the fact that marketers have to learn to give up control. You know, there was a time when I started my career and a lot of us in the room, especially some of the people sitting in the front rows somehow, uh, all seem, would have started their careers, uh, you know, at least 20 to 25, maybe 30 years ago. Uh, the concept of brand management at that point in time, I would define as controlling the brand. So what would you control? You would control the product, you would control the packaging, you would control the pricing, you would control the distribution, and of course, most importantly, you would control communication, right? And you would turn around and say, and there was a time when I remember, uh, you know, my first company in ITC, we used to actually allocate products, right? Distributor X could get only so much product because the demand was far outstripping supply in the, at, at, at that point. And there were uh, categories which did that. Hindustan Lever would do that for its surf at that point in time, right? Now, however, what is happening more and more is that you have to give up control and that control is being taken by the consumer. And what do I mean by that? The one thing that digital and social has enabled for us is that it has given the consumer a voice. Earlier, of course, there would be letters to editor, there would be complaints to uh, you know, uh, these organizations which would create these ombudsman type uh, activities. But there was no direct uh, voice that the consumer had, point number one. Point number two was that the voice that the consumer had was individual, right? What digital media has allowed us to do is it has allowed one person to be able to broadcast it to millions of people. And if that one person's voice is strong enough, or if that one person's voice is relevant enough, then millions will start echoing that voice. So what the digital environment has done is that it has created a, a, a sense of empowerment amongst people who consume, you know? The other thing that it has done is that it has taken away a lot of the credibility of traditional means of communication, i.e. traditional advertising. So a lot of the consumer research that I read nowadays shows us that uh, I would much rather believe a friend's recommendation than believe what, I, uh, what gets beamed to me from the television or what gets beamed to me from the radio. And why, why is that? Because with the proliferation of both brands and communication messages and just the sheer weight of messaging that each of us uh, goes through every day of our lives, that automatically leads to a drop in credibility which is that if every single person is telling me that their product is the best, where's the truth in it? The truth has got to lie somewhere in between, right? Because earlier, five people were telling you across different product categories that they were the best, but now there are multiple product categories and multiple competitors within, within those product categories, monopolistic competition as Anisha explained, and everybody with very minor differences is telling you that fundamentally they're the best. What that does is it drives down credibility. And that is something that our industry and all of the younger people in this room who are beginning their careers or are in the middle of their careers in marketing need to be very, very aware of 
Because if you're not aware of that and if you're not managing that, then you could be overwhelmed by a tsunami of, of, of uh, consumer resistance that you just don't know how to handle. And I have faced this in my life. Uh, one of my first challenges when I went, uh, you know, went to work in the US, uh, and I'll give you an example, there was um, one of our machines was, was malfun mal malfunctioning. I was the head of Brand Whirlpool. And uh, there were some uh, fire incidents that happened in a couple of people's homes, as in the homes didn't burn down, but the machines burned down, right? Now, you got to understand that in most machines that use motors, electricity, right, uh, sparks are possible. Of course, these things are put through safety tests, et cetera, et cetera, but the fact of the matter is accidents happen. Earlier, when accidents like this would happen, what we would do is we would do a product recall. We would change their product. We would send them an apology letter. We would send them a coupon which said, uh, for your next purchase, here is 20% off or here is 30% off, right? Life would go on. There was this one lady in Iowa, for those of you who know US geography, Iowa is a small state which is snowed under for nine months of the year. And uh, it, you know, it, it, it's not spectacular in any, it's not a California, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, uh, it's not Illinois. So there was this one lady blogger who just slammed us, absolutely slammed us, and said how the electrical systems are faulty, how all of these products are now being manufactured in China, how you know, the, the components are, are not quality controlled, how when things used to be manufactured in the US, it was so much better, and that struck a chord. The fact that US has been going through a slightly turbulent time in its manufacturing history, um, it really struck a chord. And within about two days, she had one and a half million followers to her blog, okay? Imagine a company, we, are a, we were a Midwestern manufacturing company, been in America since, you know, God knows when, and they don't know how to handle it. You do not know how to handle a dramatic uh, lack of control, because, th because this is what? This is some consumer creating a voice, broadcasting it, and that voice being picked up by one and a half million people. One and a half million in India doesn't seem like a lot, in the US, it's a lot. 350 million population, right? So the, so the dramatic level of intervention that we had to do was unprecedented because we had never faced anything in, 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 in the past like that. Absolutely had never faced anything in the past like that. You know, there is this phrase which is very almost fashionable nowadays called crowdsourcing. Everything is being crowdsourced, right? Uh, companies are being funded using crowdsourcing, movies are being funded using crowdsourcing. If you think about crowdsourcing, what is it? It's essentially somebody who has an idea who then puts it out there and says, yeah, this is my idea, I give it to you. If you like it, contribute and we'll do this together. Fundamentally, that's what crowdsourcing is all about, right? So the whole concept of brand managers controlling product life cycles is, is gone, so you have to give up control, right? And you have to have linked to this the ability to listen. I think, uh, I, I think in my career, uh, we all form opinions and we all form um, archetypes about, so we all think, uh, you know, people in the consulting industry make too much money for doing nothing, uh, we think investment bankers are highly overpaid, et cetera, et cetera. These are all archetypes. These are not true. They're just archetypes. One of the archetypes that I've always had to deal with is that brand managers are arrogant, right? Uh, when you're in sales, this is a, what do you guys know? You sit in air-conditioned offices. You deal with all these pretty agency girls. What do you know about the real world? Do you actually go out and sell? What happens, right? The fact of the matter is that some of it is true. Uh, a lot of the brand managers get very, very turned on by theoretical models, get very, very turned on by Excel spreadsheets. I've been there and done that, so this is not a criticism of all the brand managers in this room. Uh, I am as much, you know, I'm a 20-year career marketer. Um, only in the last two years I've uh, done other stuff which is not linked to marketing. Um, but yes, people tend to forget to listen to the consumer. 
and listening to the consumer is left to friends from Ipsos who will come and they will tell us what the consumer is saying. And you know, Mike, you will, you will uh, admit that the feedback that you get from a market research is only as good sometimes as the quality of the questionnaire, the quality of the interviewer, the quality of somebody who's interpreting it. There is nothing like actually talking to the consumer yourself, right? And earlier, it was hard to talk to the consumer because in India, how many consumers could you talk to? But just as digital has given a broadcast mic to the consumer, it has also given you as a marketer the means to communicate and connect and actually understand uh, from consumers what's going on. So in the US, uh, I used to work with Ipsos uh, a lot. Um, I'd say about 92, 93% of all research has moved online. You know, there aren't physical focus groups, there aren't physical depth interviews anymore. There are some, but, but not a lot. So what, that is, what the web is also doing, what technology is also doing, is it's also giving you the means to listen. And my personal advice to all the young marketers in this room is let's just learn to listen. Because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we believe that because we control the brand and that's how we've grown up, because we know the brand well, because all the brand keys, the brand circles, the brand positioning statements, all the good things are in a folder in our desks. We believe we know the brand. Please understand the guys who know the brand best are the consumers who are using it, right? And who are actually physically taking out their wallets and voting for you with their wallets. That is the ultimate power. So please learn to listen, right? The second thing is that uh, linked to this is you've got to understand that brand and product plans, they evolve and sometimes you don't control that evolution, but you have to participate in that evolution. So you have a plan and you build this whole thing up to launch and then there is this competitor who launches two weeks ahead of you with a product that you know is superior at a price point that you know is better than yours. What do you do? In my day and age, we would go ahead and launch and we would say, Dekh lenge market mein. that doesn't work any day, anymore. But the f because the fact of the matter is that distribution, which used to be a competitive advantage, is now a hygiene factor. You know, when I joined, when I started my career in 1993, one of the things that I used to be very, very enamored of and very turned on by was the fact that ITC Limited in those days would reach 10 million outlets. Okay, it would physically reach 10 million outlets every week. We had a weekly replenishment cycle. And just the, you know, just the sheer number of zeros would be very, very turning on for a young 23-year-old guy out of IM who's never done a day of work in his life. Uh, 20 years and thousands of gray hair later, I realize that that's no big deal. Everybody has it. Everybody has it. They figured out ways of doing it, you know, things like hub and spoke, because people learn very quickly from each other nowadays. Very, very quickly from each other. So in my company, in my business today, we reach out to about 8 million homes every morning, actually 8.2 million homes every morning within a 30 minute window with products, i.e. newspapers, managed and that are your assortment. So even the ITCs and the Unilevers, they do 10 million, but they do it weekly, we do it daily, right? They cannot guarantee your assortment, we do. So if you want paper X and paper Y, uh, I'm not gonna take any brand names because that would be conflict of interest for me on this on, on uh, the stage. But yes, uh, paper X from company Y, paper Y from company Z, put them together, that's an assortment. Right, and you get it 363 days of the year. Uh, you know, average two days off in a in a year, 
and you get it undamaged within a 30 minute window between 6.30 and 7 or between 6.45 and 7.15 every single day. If you think about the task and what that means, it's Herculean. My company puts out 1,200 tons of paper under people's doors every day, 1,200 tons. And we do that using outstandingly advanced technology called the human hand. It's true, right? So think of, think of uh, turning around and, and, and pushing through 1,200 tons every morning, okay? Using a bicycle and a human being. That is the level of sophistication that we've received. But is that a competitive advantage for us? No, it is not. Because if, you know, one of my competitors, because the, the, the vendor network is co-developed, that is the strength of the newspaper industry in this country. One of the reasons that newspaper industry is floundering in countries like the West is that they've never co-developed the vendor network. They've never co-developed the delivery mechanism, right? So distribution, market strength, monopolistic practices saying if you don't give me X number of tons, I will not give you this product. All of that used to go on. If you want to buy, you know, if you want surf, then you please buy sunlight, etc., etc. None of that can give you sustainable comparative advantage. It can give you comparative advantage for a while, right? During launch, just a little while later, etc., etc. Definitely not sustainable comparative advantage. So what can give you this uh, competitive advantage? What can give you sustainable competitive advantage? Everybody might have different uh, points of view on this because there's no right answer as in what is the sustainable competitive advantage that we're looking for. My uh, personal opinion is how flexible you are as a company. How flexible is your manufacturing? Because the most inflexible thing that I have come across in my life is really the manufacturing systems. We can do this and not that, right? And if we do this, then we can only do this because manufacturing typically works of scale. Scale by definition makes it unflex inflexible, right? However, there are companies, really good companies, Volkswagen for instance, who have set up a dramatically flexible manufacturing system which is fungible globally, right? So if they have a problem in Germany, their China plant can take over to at least 60, 65, 70%. If they have a problem in the US, they can start sourcing stuff from India because modular systems are being created. So how flexible are you in terms of your manufacturing? How flexible are you in terms of your pricing? How flexible are you in terms of your distribution? Right? How flexible are you in terms of media? I think people don't, uh, people play, pay very little, um, very little heed to one of the most critical parts of the success of a product nowadays. What are you doing with the media? How are you using what medium? What is that medium doing to you? What is that message that you're communicating? How are you listening to feedback and changing your creatives around? How are you listening to feedback and changing your media plan around? Somebody a little while ago asked uh, a question uh, saying, what about media planning? Uh, you know. I'll stand up and take the heat for it. Media planners as a tribe don't exist. They've all been killed by media buyers all over the world, right? So they plan and the, the buyers tell you, here's what we can get you because it's cheap, so please buy it. So this whole bulk mentality, everything is bulk, right? Everything is masked up. By definition, the more you bulk up and the more you mass up, the less flexible you are. And that's, and that's what's going on. So my whole... Uh, call it advice, call it counsel, call it just, you know, uh, a middle-aged man speaking, uh, try and see how flexible you can be with your systems right through the value chain, right through the value chain. Not only just manufacturing, but manufacturing, sourcing, media, pricing, how you take it to market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, two other points before I, uh, before I end. One is, uh, I think we all need to learn to befriend technology. Technology is not the web. Technology is not um, the internet or Facebook or uh, Twitter. So if you don't have a Twitter account, it's not that you're not technologically savvy. The question really is, 
how can technology be a friend? I think I meet a lot of people who are very scared of what technology will do to their business. And if you're scared of technology, what you will essentially do, it's like going into a dark room. You know, I was having this conversation with my 13-year-old daughter last night. She's very scared of the dark. I was telling her that, listen, at the end of the day, you can't get rid of fear. You can only conquer it. You can only go into the dark room and see what lies there, you know? Technology is a little bit like that. We can either choose to say, oh, we have to protect ourselves from this, this monster called technology which will come and eat us up. And you're, sh you're right, it'll come and eat us up. Or you can reach out and meet it. You can reach out and try and understand what's going on. You can reach out and try and befriend it. If you befriend technology, chances are that you'll be able to walk hand in hand with him or her. But if you try to resist it, uh, you can't. Because technology, philosophically speaking, is like life. It, it carries on, irrespective of whether you are going along with it or not. It just, just carries on. So befriend technology. And uh, I will end with one of my most uh, favorite sayings. You know, uh, as a career uh, corporate executive and as, uh, as a person who went to a business school, business schools basically in the first uh, few terms, uh, I believe, perform lobotomy on you. They cut off a part of your brain. They, um, you know, they take that brain and put that in a matrix form. Um, one of my professors told me this, and I have always followed it, and I just wanted to share it with the group uh, at the end, which is that all of your brains, he said to us, um, are like microscopes. They, are, they look at a case study of 73 pages and arrive at a conclusion in one and a half hours of an exam and get graded on it. Right, with 35 pages of spreadsheets attached. Microscopes are useful, so are telescopes. So if we can go out and invest in a good telescope, if we can go out and have the ability to get a longer and a bigger picture, forget the detail for a moment, the detail will come. But if we can go out and invest in a good telescope, uh, both at a personal and at a professional level, I think we will all do well. And things like product life cycles and monopolistic competitions will keep us less awake at night uh, than they do today. Thank you very much.